First, I'd like to thank the FSIP board for inviting me back. I was here last in 2016 speaking on spinal cord stimulation and radio frequency lesioning, and I can say I've never had an introduction like that. Um, pleasure to be here. And uh, I uh, also just want to say uh, and acknowledge Gabor Rax for uh, his tutelage over the many years that I met him first in the, in the early 90s, and I uh, had the opportunity to spend a lot of time with him. And through that, the relationships that I have have had with, again, some of the greatest people in the world in our field, uh, many of whom that I'm friends with, and I'm very thankful for that. So I'm from Augusta, and uh, let's see. I, uh, I was past president at GSIP for a little while, about 10 years ago, and still on the board. We do a lot of great things, as FSIP does, and uh, in order to uh, maintain our field of medicine, which I think is one of the most awesome fields that exists, to help patients with chronic pain. But I just want to remind you that, what do I do? Use that one instead. Okay. And that back and the laser. Okay. Just want to remind you that for those of us who are old enough to remember, can you hear me? 50 years ago today was the walk on the moon with Neil Armstrong. I remember getting up at 4 o'clock in the morning and uh, seeing him walk the moon, and uh, that was an amazing thing. Just wanted to remember that. So I have no financial disclosures, and I have no bad jokes. I try to look for a good pain joke, and most of them were too politically incorrect, so I, I'm not doing any of those. This is where I live most of the time, Augusta Pain Center. It's a multidisciplinary uh, facility, and we've got a, a clinic, uh, behavioral team, aquatic and physical therapy with certified therapists, and a Joint Commission Certified Surgery Center, and uh, a great staff, which is the most important thing, people who support you, and we get compliments essentially every day. So uh, my objectives today are for you to understand the purpose and indications for epidural lysis, to present evidence-based literature for that, and to afford you the uh, ability to perform and incorporate epidural lysis procedures into your practice. So I was asked to come together with three questions. So those at the end of the talk, you should be able to answer, what are the three indications for epidural lysis? Uh, is scar tissue in the epidural space a primary pain generator? What five medications are the most commonly used employed uh, medications for epidural lysis? So just a little introduction. Um, lifetime prevalence of low back pain is between 60 and 80%. 10 to 20% of acute low back pain develops into chronic pain. Uh, there's about 1.6 million spinal fusions annually in the U.S., and post-laminectomy syndrome occurs in about 10 to 40 percent of those patients. Epidural fibrosis occurs in about a third of all five, uh, failed back syndrome cases, and as we all know, low back pain is one of the most uh, significant causes of disability in the U.S. with estimated cost to us in the hundreds of billions of dollars. So I'll go through the definition of epidural lysis talk about mechanisms of pain that I find uh, tremendously interesting, um, evidence regarding lysis, some indications, and then procedure protocols. So nomenclature. Uh, epidural lysis is referred to by many different names, so you'll see different uh, re references in the literature to epidural neuroplasty, neurolysis, epidural lysis, epidural adhesiolysis, percutaneous, percutaneous adhesiolysis, or epidural neuroplasty. All those terms are synonymous. So I'm going to start you out with history. This is the tessellated pavement uh, state preserve in Tasmania that we were in earlier this year. And this is 300 million years ago. So I'm going to start there and bring you forward. I grew up here. And what I mean I grew up here, I grew up 10 minutes from here and uh, met my beautiful wife in second grade. And when I was a kid, we had a cabana at this hotel when I was two years old up until 12 years old, right here. So what I wanted to show you was up here, that's what the hotel looked like, and that's the diving board I learned to dive on. And back here are cabanas, where we had a cabana for 10 years. And this place has grown tremendously. 1958, the original building was built. In 1984, a second building was built over there. And uh, the next thing you know, we have this beautiful building we're in right now that was built in 2002. So as far as history, epidural analgesia began in 1885. We had um, epidurals for sciatica in 1909 and epidurography beginning in 1921 when it was first reported. The first use of epidural steroids was via an S1 foraminal approach, and that was in 1953. 
Hypertonic saline was first in the medical literature around 1967. Happens to be the same year spinal cord stimulation uh, started. And uh, epidural neuroplasty, which is the, uh, the subject of today's discussion, started in 1980. The first use of epidural hypertonic saline for lysis was in 1989 with hyaluronidase in 1994. So from Gabor's mouth to my ears, when I asked him how would you define it, he said it is the site-specific delivery of medication where the pressure volume effect of medication frees up the nerve root, reduces swelling, and allows the return of mobility. Another way to put that is the disruption of scar tissue and freeing of spinal nerve roots in the epidural space to allow deposition of medication at the site of pathology and pain generation in order to improve function. So that's what this procedure is all about. Epidural lysis is site-specific, uses a catheter. Uh, fluid injection is involved. It utilizes multiple medications, opens up the perineural space around the, uh, path, the uh, nerve root where the pain is being generated, frees up that nerve root, and it reduces inflammation, pain, and swelling. So there are multiple mechanisms of action. You know, how does epidural lysis of adhesions work? There's different means. Um, and a hydraulic means is basically by the fluid that you inject through the, the catheter. Uh, chemical means is by the different medications that we put in there. And mechanical isn't uh, the primary uh, way to uh, break up the adhesions because you don't want to just jam a catheter in there, a stiff catheter, and go and get a uh, subdural or intrathecal injection. So mechanical is uh, probably the least of those as far as improvement. So the goals of epidural lysis is to reduce pain and improve function. So what causes pain? Asked the uh, bighorn sheep in Badland, South Dakota last year. Epidural adhesions, uh, we talk about those all the time. Epidural adhesions, though, themselves do not cause pain. Adhesions are where you've got an abnormal union of epidural membrane surfaces due to inflammation or injury. So the proposed etiologies of chronic low back and leg pain include inflammation, edema, epidural or perineural fibrosis, neural compression, spinal stenosis, post lamb syndrome, disc herniation, vascular compromise, mechanical pressure on the posterior longitudinal ligament, as well as central sensitization. So any of those things may be involved in these things that we do every day, whether we're doing a lysis procedure, or a transferamal, or whatever we're doing. Um, so these, these are the basic etiologies of what we deal with every single day. So it's, it was very interesting for me to learn and, and go back and look at the original uh, literature that was done for a lot of this back in the 80s. And uh, it's real interesting. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. So in order to be a pain generator, you must have a nerve supply. It's an anatomical structure that must have a neural pathway for, per for perception. So pain generators are not, uh, are not identified or, or uh, diagnosed you know, where pain's coming from based on radiological studies. And we all know that there's multiple studies, hundreds of studies in the literature regarding that. There's one a review article in particular that uh, looked at 370 MRI CT scans together and looked at um, pain generators, uh, spinal, ab spinal abnormal findings on, on these radiological studies by every decade. Uh, from about 35 years to 80 years old to see the false positive rates in spinal pain uh, abnormalities in patients who are all asymptomatic. That's why we know that by the time patients are 80 years old, they're going to have a 96% incidence of disc disease. So we see uh, patients every day that come to us and they tell us, when I move like this, I feel my disc you know, pushing back. That's what hurts. Uh, they, they've got a lot of misconceptions because a lot of their physicians have told them Look at the MRI. This is why you're hurt. And there's a lot of untruth to that, especially as you get older. So that's this reality. It's more, more false positives occur as we all get older. So spinal pain generators. Um, the way that they're basically classified is axial or radicular. Radicular is where you've got nerve root dura uh, involvement. And uh, that's really the only way that you get radicular pain affecting the nerve root. The other pain generators are all axial, whether it's the ventral dura, uh, facet joints, SI joints, disc, bone, muscle, ligaments, or fascia. So Q. Slitch is a, an orthopedic surgeon, uh, and uh, back in 1991, did this awesome study where they looked at, they had done 700 case, spinal cases under local anesthesia with patients wide awake. 
And what they did was they either stimulated the different structures or manipulated them to see what causes pain. So which of those structures actually cause pain? Fascinating. I don't think we can do that anymore. But uh, pain, radicular pain is produced by the movement of swollen inflamed nerve roots. Normal nerve roots that are not stretched or compressed do not cause pain. So they also noted that there's associated irritation via direct mechanical encasement of the nerve roots within scar tissue. Also, epidural venous engorgement with resultant nerve root edema. And scar tissue compounded the pain that was associated with the nerve root by fixing it in one position, increasing that susceptibility of the nerve root to tension or compression. So this is what happens. This is, this is the premise behind a lot of things that we do. The fixation of the root by scar tissue, whether it's from surgery or not surgery, we're going to talk about that. Um, that's what causes it. It's that stretch on that root that's inflamed, swollen, compressed, or stretched. So very interesting stuff. So how do we diagnose epidural fibrosis? MRI, CT, and myelography are unreliable. We do it by epidurography. And uh, epidurography was, is what we look for, these filling defects. That's where the dye does not go because uh, liquid takes the path of least resistance. So when we inject dye into the epidural space, it will not go where scar tissue is located. It will take the path of least resistance. And we all see this every day when we do live fluoroscopy. So Rax and Manchikanti both uh, noted that caudal epidurography was effective in correlating filling defect with the patient's reported level of pain. So that's very important. And uh, now I'm going to talk a little bit about epidural fibrosis. So the etiology may be surgical or non-surgical. We know that post-laminectomy syndrome occurs in about uh, 10 to 40 percent of lumbar spine operations, such as laminectomy, fusion, or microsurgery. And that the probability of pain increases after lumbar discectomy with peridural scarring as that increases. So what they found was different types of scar tissue. There's scar tissue that's not so significant, and then there's excessive scarring. They found that excessive scarring could increase the rate of recurrent radicular pain by three times compared to patients that do not have epidural scar extensive scarring. From a non-surgical standpoint, again, multiple etiologies, including annular tears, hematoma, infection, intrathecal contrast, all these things cause inflammatory problems to occur with infiltration of cells and so forth. So when I was an anesthesiologist back in 1985, we used to do, um, and I was, I was a resident, and shortly thereafter, we used to do epidural steroid injections with patients sitting in the recovery room, and that's what we did. And I was always amazed to figure out how, when I would inject whatever, you know, a little bit of local anesthetic and steroid, that by the time I got the needle out of some of those patients, they were already telling me their pain was gone. And I always thought, how does that happen? And I thought, mm, maybe it's like some kind of washout of like an acid or something like that. And that's what I thought for years until we, see, we saw some data that uh, the Saul brothers came out with in the 1990s that um, basically uh, exposed the role of phospholipase A2, and there's all these other inflammagens that we know about um, that cause inflammation. And they did a study with disc herniations. They homogenized the discs and then measured the phospholipase A2 and found that in, in degenerative discs or herniated discs that the concentration of these inflammagens may be increased by thousands of times. So that's what happens. That's what this is all about. And we know that quite well by now. But back then, you know, it was interesting. In the early days, when I trained, uh, we didn't have textbooks on, on interventional pain. We didn't have journals. We barely had a society. We didn't have a, an interventional society, but we didn't have textbooks, really. They started coming out in the mid-'90s, so it was really interesting. In my early days, I had to go visit people to learn. So I visited Gabor. I visited uh, Winston Paris, Michael, Mike Hammer. You know, different people in our field at the time that were doing certain great things, and that's the only way we had to learn. Then we had a lot of those uh, cadaver courses, and now we've got all these fellowships and excellent training and meetings like this. So this is just a uh, schematic on an annular tear where you see the different inflammagens leaking out of the disc, causing the uh, fibrosis and other problems that we, uh, and pain that we deal with every day. So, um, so McCarran uh, did a study back in 1989 and what he did was, it was uh, eight dogs, four dogs were controls and four dogs were not. They basically uh, took out some of the nucleus pulposus and then homogenized it and re-injected it back into four of those dogs. And then after a few weeks, they euthanized them. 
And uh, what they found was this severe inflammatory reaction occurred. So this is what you see. This is a, uh, an example of just a, one of the spinal cords from the dogs. You can see the erythema, and, and they're swelling, and that's what happens. So these things are real. All these times, all these years with the, you know, the insurance companies that we deal with now, you know, oh, you can't have chronic inflammation, you know. Well, sure you can, and this is what happens. This, we know that, but they don't know it, and they don't acknowledge it. But this is what happens. This is why people come in to see us. They need treatment, not get one shot, and we're all better. Most of the patients we see with chronic pain are degenerative disease patients. So we have to tell them. It's like heart disease and lung disease. You know, you're not going to get one antihypertensive today, and the problem's going to go away forever. That's a treatment that you have to get every day for the rest of your life. Same thing's true with chronic pain. These patients need care in an ongoing fashion. We do our best to figure out what works best for that individual, what lasts the longest. We've got some incredible modalities today with radiofrequency lesioning, some of which in my practice have lasted more than 15 years, spinal cord stimulation, seeing some of those patients back after that long, long time. And then every now and then, I've got one patient who had an injection 16 years ago, an epidural injection, still pain-free. And this week, I had a ganglion of impar block from seven years ago. Two blocks, that's all she had, still pain-free, and coming to visit for something else. Anyway, peri uh, periradicular fibrosis and vascular abnormalities also occur with herniated discs. And Hoyland in 1989 showed that pathological changes, including perineural and intraneural fibrosis, nerve root edema, and focal demyelination occur in and around the nerve root complex with foraminal venous obstruction. That's another thing that happens. Another mechanism is the disengorgement that can occur in the foramen, um, and that can cause different inflammagen mediators that cause these patients problems. And that's often underlooked, but one of the mechanisms of pain that we all know about is ischemia, whether it's spinal cord or other, other uh, pain generators. So Weinstein also uh, discussed the presence of epidural ligaments or scarring that may prevent, migra that may prevent uh, migration of posteriorly administered injectate to the anterior epidural space. So we all know that around 20 years ago now, when transframinals became the, th the in vogue thing to do, that the reason that they were more effective, and that's, uh, that was reported early on, and I know Ken Candido might object to that with all my uh, due respect there. And uh, the, uh, the thing for years has been you have to get to the ventrolateral epidural space. That's where everything's happening. That's where the nerve roots uh, contacting the disc. That's where you have all the stenosis, foraminal, uh, central, and so forth. But we noted you know, back then, and, I, and you know, 20, 25 years ago, that these ligaments would prevent your medication from getting where you needed to go. Well, I, I would see that in my practice, and I'm going to show you some slides in a minute. But uh, then Andrade uh, noted that the foraminal approach provides that good ventral flow, whereas interlaminar is predominantly a dorsal flow. And if you do what I do, and I do the same thing for 25 years or more now, every single case I do is live fluoro, and I watch the dye, and I do a lot of lateral views, and I see where it goes. So I see how fast things move, how fast the liquid moves, and it's a safety thing. Because you can't tell sometimes where medicine goes if you got intravascular absorption, if you got uh, subdural or subarachnoid injections, if you don't watch it, and they're different. Subdural, quick, you know. And uh, intrathecal, which I, I saw it many, many years ago, uh, it's, it's like a flow. It's pretty awesome to see these things, but you don't want to see it. So here's some pictures. So these are, these are more than 20 years old. So you know when you do these things and you actually watch what you do, um, you see the picture on the left is a, uh, this is an interlaminar epidural at L45. And you can see how we have unilateral flow. And so this is the way I've been practicing for about 20, 20 or more years. And now we have a lot of literature, thanks to Dr. Candido, on uh, para, you know, parasagittal injection of paravertebral epidural injections that are interlaminar and how you can achieve pretty good spread of your medication. But every patient's different. You got um, liquid taking the path of least resistance. So what you see here, and I used to use 10 milliliters in these, and I see some surgeons now that don't get to uh, get their surgeries approved anymore doing epidurals with an interlaminar approach with two milliliters, and no wonder why they don't get anywhere and the patients don't do well because most of the, patient, most of the medication, as you see with the Omnipake, does stay posteriorly in the epidural space. And in this case, it's interesting, but you don't see much at all getting to where you want it to get to. And that's, uh, this is a cervical epidural interlaminar again, where you do see 
more of unilateral spread, and same thing. If they've got unilateral pain, you go a little bit off the midline, and very commonly in different areas, the, cer the cervical, uh, maybe not as much as some other areas, but you'll often see uh, either um, bilateral spread or sometimes you will see unilateral spread. So here's a transforaminal, and what you see here at the same level, L4-5, uh, looks like the outline of a dorsal root ganglion with the root, and you see beautiful spread coming around the, the pedicle, and then in a lateral view, this is what this is all about. In the lateral view, you see it anteriorly. And this is, this is a perfect demonstration of why we do transforaminals or paravertebral interlaminars with Dr. Candido's technique. So, so we're going to talk a little bit about evidence for epidural lysis. So in 1999, Laxman Chikani looked at adhesive lysis and hypertonic saline for low back pain. And what he did, uh, historically, prior to that time, epidural lysis was done in a three-day procedure. So you did the things that we're going to go through. That was done as a one-day thing. And then the patients were, were uh, kept in the hospital for the next two days. And did another injection the following day with local anesthetic and uh, then some hypertonic saline. And that was repeated a total of three times. So in 1999, Lax uh, Manchikani said, well, let's look at this and see how people do if you only have one or two days, which may be more practical. And he found in this initial study that it was efficacious and um, also cost effective. So the conclusion was that the one day procedure is safe and cost effective, that repeat or multiple procedures provided significant pain relief with increasing duration in a stepwise fashion, and that there was no significant difference between one, two, or three day adhesiolysis. So then a couple of years passed by, and he looks at this with a randomized controlled clinical trial and concluded that adhesiolysis with hypertonic saline performed on a one-day basis is effective for chronic low back pain, uh, patients that, that failed uh, epidural steroid injections. And then we go forward about three more years, and now there's a randomized double-blind trial. And basically, there were three groups, a control group with uh, local anesthetic and steroid, and then two other groups that were both with adhesiolysis. In other words, they both had hyaluronidase, with the third group having uh, hypertonic saline in addition to that. And what he found was that the two groups with adhesiolysis, that was with hyaluronidase or hyaluronidase plus hypertonic saline, um, had statistically different differences in pain relief, the SOS3 disability index, and range of motion. So then about five years later, I was involved with a systematic review. Uh, looking at percutaneous adhesiolysis for chronic low back pain in post-lumbar uh, post surgery syndrome. And uh, it's hard for me to see that far, but um, we looked at a, a number of studies at the time, did a literature search and found three randomized and four uh, observational studies, and basically concluded that the level of evidence at that time was level one or level two one, which was pretty strong evidence. This is in 2009, hard to believe it's 10 years ago, but that's what we found. And then friend and colleague Stan Helm, uh, a couple of years later, looked at a similar thing with not just uh, post-lumbar surgery syndrome, but also with spinal stenosis. And at that time, um, looking at a couple more of the studies that had come out, they concluded that uh, according to the, uh, you know, the criteria we were using at the time with the US task force, was that the evidence at that time was fair for uh, percutaneous adhesiolysis. So then we fast forward um, the next year, the last update of the guidelines came out and the recommendations in that guideline based on all the evidence previously for um, adhesiolysis was that percutaneous adhesiolysis is recommended in patients with post-lumbar surgery syndrome as well as central spinal stenosis after failure of conservative therapy. Now we've got another systematic review and meta-analysis that uh, took place in 2016 with Stan Helm again and this study looked at the effectiveness of adhesiolysis uh, with chronic refractory low back and lower extremity pain. And their conclusion at that time now was that the level of evidence was strong again, and uh, that uh, this is indicated in the treatment of chronic low back as well as lower extremity pain. So we've got a number of, of uh, clinical trials and review articles, randomized control trials that have shown efficacy. And one last one in 2016, this is in cervical disc disease. They uh, looked at epidural neuroplasty and compared it to epidural steroid injections and found that cervical epidural neuroplasty uh, was superior to cervical epidural steroid injections with better 
neck disability index outcomes, as well as greater reduction in pain, VAS scores. So we're going to talk briefly about uh, hypertonic saline. So back in 1999, Jim Hevner was Gabor Rax's right-hand man. He was director of research, one of the most incredible people you'll ever meet, and unfortunately passed away a few years ago, but what a great man. And uh, he, did so, he did so much work in Lubbock. Uh, this was one of the studies from 99, looking at and comparing uh, normal saline with hypertonic saline to determine if they influence the outcome of the studies. And in conclusion, they found that hyaluronidase did not change the outcome, but that less patients given hypertonic saline required, uh, less patients required additional treatments versus the control group. Now I'll talk a little about hyaluronidase. Why do we use it? Hyaluronidase helps facilitate the spread of liquids, medication. And uh, we used to use it in epidurals sometimes in the old days. But um, what it does is it reduces neutrophil infiltration and thereby reduces swelling and pain. And neutrophil infiltration is the initial step in the inflammatory process. So it's interesting that uh, you know, this was utilized for many, many years now. And in a uh, study reported in 1996, um, Dr. Rax's experience showed that hyaluronidase did reduce the neuroplasty treatment failure rate from 18 to 6 percent. Then in uh, 2012, uh, Kim did a study looking at patients with failed back surgery syndrome with hyaluronidase as well as triamcinolone and found that, that the patients that had those two things combined had more long-term efficacy to reduce pain and improve function compared to, uh, excuse me, after epidural steroid injections, and they noted a synergistic effect. So for all of those, so uh, this is the point when most people are starting to fall asleep. I'm seeing some of my best friends nod off here. But I'm from Augusta. Yes, I have played at the Augusta National, and we're going to move on here. So indications. Epidural scarring, fibrosis, failed back, or neck surgery syndrome, disc disruption with, with or without radiculopathy, uh, spinal stenosis, vertebral compression fractures, and multilevel degenerative arthritis are some of the indications. There are some more. Contraindications, the usual epidural things like anticoagulations, patients, neurological deficits, allergies to medication that you might use, Spinal instability, syrinx, pregnant or lactating women. Arachnoiditis is still a relative contraindication, whereas sepsis and patient refusal are absolute contraindications. So we're just going to talk about the technique for a few minutes. Most important thing, and I don't know, the timer is not on. I don't know where I'm at. Oh. Uh, OK. So I'm done. Oh, is that? I get 30 minutes. It says 20. So anyway, so uh, I'm not finished. The best parts here. OK, thank you. So know your target point. This is very important based on your patient's history, physical exam, dermatomal pattern, and, and correlate that with the radiological studies that you get. So if you've got a radicular pattern, you should know where the radicular pattern falls. Is it an L5? Is it an L4? C6? C8? Whatever it might be. So that you will, and this is what we do for all the cases that we do, whether it's a transforaminal or any kind of procedure, you always want to think, well, where's the pathology? And then you need to look at your MRI and correlate it, especially now because we have to go through pre-authorizations with peer reviews frequently. And if you can't explain that that patient's problem has a structural abnormality, which I don't really agree with all the time, um, you, don't get, you don't get approved. So you have to say, OK, even though you got an L4-5 disc, why do we have an S1 radic? Right? It goes down the back of the leg, and I want to get the S1 root. They don't understand that, but you have to educate them. And then they usually give you authorization. So the technique itself, you start off in an AP view with a, a little local anesthetic in the midline. Usually you start off a couple of centimeters below the sacral hiatus. And epidural act, access can be uh, performed cervical, thoracic, lumbar, or sacral. So in the cervical region, usually the C7-T1 level or the T1-2 level are used. Uh, there's something else called the scarring triangle, which unfortunately I will not have time to do. That's one of the, the newer concepts that Gabor Rax has talked about in recent years. It's fascinating that his explanation is, for 35 years, I never understood why these patients didn't get better, even with surgery, with all the other things that we do, and figured out it has to do with this scarring triangle at L5S1. And there's an awesome study by Tasky that was done that looks at the volume in that area. Uh, in real patients having surgery versus cadavers, and it's 0.9 uh, mLs in live people and 1.1 in the cadaver study for the averages. It's really fascinating, but that epidural scarring that occurs at the L5-S1 level 
you can access through S1 and break it up, but it's medial, it's not lat ventral lateral. So this is another fascinating new thing that's just been discovered in the last few years, which is awesome. The caudal approach obviously is the most common way that we access it. There are different catheters that are utilized uh, for the technique. So what you do is insert the needle uh, via the sacral, hi sacral hiatus, aspirate, and the first thing you do is an epidurogram. So you can inject usually five to 10 mLs. You wanna see where the uh, omnipate goes, and with the initial few milliliters, look in a lateral view to make sure that you've got cephalad spread, that it's not coming back out the, the sacral hiatus. Uh, you can't do much about anterior foraminal flow, but um, sometimes you can reposition the needle possibly a little higher, maybe above S4, but you don't want to go above S3 because of the risk of dural puncture. Um, you want to make sure and rule, that you rule out uh, vascular, subdural, subarachnoid injections and identify and document the filling defect. So that's what this is all about. You know, if you do this and there's no filling defect, then you didn't have a problem. So you should see a filling defect. So this is basically placement of the needle, and what you're gonna see next is the placement as it goes in, as it goes in, it goes in, you just bring that, that uh, bevel down and get it into the sacral epidural canal, and the next thing you can do is inject a little dye, and now you see a nice pattern. It's all going cephalad as we desire. And then you go back to an AP view and you see your epidurogram. So in this case, as you see, you know, no medication got up above L5, uh, the S1 segment. And the uh, sacral epidural canal anatomy is such that it varies tremendously from patient to patient with regard to volume. And that'll, that volume will uh, vary between about 12 and 65 milliliters in the sacrum. So some patients you may get pretty good flow going uh, cephalad. Others you may get all of it coming out down here. It all takes the path of le least resistance. Um, but this is not uncommon at all, especially when you've got epidural scarring from a previous laminectomy. So the next thing you do is rotate the bevel 90 to, or, uh, to 135 degrees toward the side of the pathology. You may have bilateral, you may have to do that on both sides, but initially, you know, start out where you're gonna start out. And then place a 15 degree bend about one inch from the tip of the catheter and advance that catheter to the desired lesion site and tell the patients right before you're gonna do that, like we do with stims and everything else we do, uh, you may get a you know, shooting pain down your leg, let me know if you do. These patients in my hands are always done awake. Um, my practice, we don't sedate people, we do some oral uh, benzos and that's about it, and I do that for all the cases that I do, um, and have done that for as long as I can remember, forever. Um, you also wanna confirm the ventral lateral placement of that tip in AP and lateral views, remove the stylet and the needle, and then place the connector on. So the next thing you do after you've advanced the catheter to your desired target is you will aspirate and then give some more omnipake. Omnipake is, is, are your eyes. So you put in a little omnipake and you see what's going on now. Put in another medicine, put in some omnipake and see what's going on. Always, you have to remember to check lower, um, lower extremity motor function. Ask the patients to wiggle their toes or their legs to make sure that you don't have a subdural uh, or intrathecal, uh, excuse me, intrathecal injection, which would happen quickly. Subdural injections usually take sometimes about 25 minutes for onset, so it's usually an intrathecal injection you want to make sure of. And then aspirate and inject hyaluronidase. In the old days, it was always hyaluronidase that was bovine. Now there's a human recombinant called Hylinex, 150 units of that, or 1,500 units of the hyaluronidase and 10 milliliters of preservative free saline. Then again, aspirate and use some omnipake, see where you're at. So here we are, this is where the catheter had just gotten placed. This patient had a left L4 radiculi radiculopathy. So you can see that the tip is at the medial, infra inframedial aspect of the pedicle of L4 on the left. And this is right when I now injected additional omni, and you can see the pattern. There's a filling defect at the L4-5 foramen. Now I've added hyaluronidase, the spreading agent, and now look what happens. You start to get a little bit of flow coming out the foramen right here around the pedicle. And at least it's a start. You also get more flow cephalad. And this is then uh, with some uh, additional omnipake. And what you see compared to the last one is that now you've got spread more cephalad and even a little bit on the contralateral side with flow going out the foramen. One of the most important things to always pay attention to is runoff. Runoff is where your dye is going either out the foramina or up and down the canal. You have to have this. If you don't have this and you're, and you're injecting and it gets tight, you can have a loculation. Loculations can result in neurological injury, especially if you're above where the cord's located. Extremely important because uh, cord ischemia is what can result in a severe problem, a, a severe um, 
neurological deficit. So you've got to make absolutely sure of this. And there is documentation. There was an article in 2016 that looked for cervical epidural neuroplasty. That contrast runoff did correlate with improved clinical outcomes and less pain. So the caudal technique, just finishing up. Visualize and document the dye spread into the area where you had a previous filling defect, okay, and that you've outlined the nerve root. Aspirate, and now you can give the local anesthetic and steroid. Historically, we used bupivacaine and, uh, in the old days, Depomedrol. Then it was triamcinolone. And then we, a lot of us have gone to dexamethasone. A uh, recent discussion with Gabor in the last few days is that typically he, will, he uses triamcinolone. And there's evidence in the literature that I presented earlier that triamcinolone and hyaluronidase were effective. And that's, that's in uh, uh, an outcome study. So you can use that. You can use um, also uh, a micron filter after that. If you put the micron filter on before the steroid, particulate steroids may get taken out. So you don't want to do it until after you do your steroid injection. And then what you want to do is observe the patient over the next 20 to 30 minutes to make sure that there's no motor block. Um, next thing you do after that is a hypertonic saline. It used to be infusion. Now you can actually do an, a slow injection. In the old days, we would wait the same 20 to 30 minutes and then use an infusion pump and infuse hypertonic saline, 10% hypertonic saline, uh, over the next 30 minutes. Now it's been shown you can do it faster, usually by push, but usually about a 10 or 15 minute time period. The next thing, uh, again, that I can't stress enough is neural flossing exercises. So this is real interesting. The dura actually moves, and Gabor uh, has done studies and looked at this to see how much the dura moves. It may even move like a whole spinal segment. When you move, you know, we know all the nerves, nerve roots move in and out of the foramina. That's why if you've got a fibrotic fixed nerve, that's why you get pain. But the dura moves also. So there's this thing that, that he describes as the dural tug. And the dural tug is where you have severe flexion. The point is the dura moves and you can pinpoint where the axial pain is coming from, especially in spinal uh, stenosis patients. So very interesting. Can't stress enough how important it is to do these flossing exercises to move things and free up those nerve roots. Here's the last slide on this. And basically what you see is now injectate washout. So where you had that dark omnipaque just a minute ago under the pedicle, it's now gone because your injectate, the local anesthetic and steroid, have now pushed that out, not there anymore. So beautiful, beautiful uh, procedure. So this is just something I put together uh, probably about a dozen years ago and modified it recently with the newer volumes. In the old days, if you look at the original descriptions of the procedure in the 80s, sometimes 50 or 60 milliliters were utilized. And now, still, maybe 30 or 40 milliliters in the lumbar region, obviously less in the thoracic or cervical region. And for the one-day technique, which is what most everybody does, and what, what Dr. Rax has moved to is a one-day three-injection technique. And what he'll do is what we just did, and then about six or eight hours later, he'll do a second injection with local and with uh, hypertonic saline, and then do that one more time. So those will be three injections within a 24-hour period. So potential complications, the usual bleeding, nerve injury, infection, or allergic reactions, and then you've got to be cautious regarding subdural or subarachnoid injection, spinal cord ischemia and paralysis, which are extremely rare, as are bowel and bladder dysfunction. Cardiac arrhythmias may occur sometimes with hypertonic saline and uh, other things that we do with local anesthetics. Perineural numbness has uh, been seen to last up to one month, but again, that's rare. And catheter shearing, you've got to be cautious about how you do this. So here's an example of uh, subdural injection from probably about 20 years ago. Something like that, and here we go with the conclusion. So, I hope what I've shown is that epidural lysis of adhesions is an evidence-based, reasonable, safe, and cost-effective pain management technique that can be utilized successfully in properly selected patients to treat a variety of chronic pain conditions. And I thank you very much for your attention. And these are two books that are out. The red one's from 1989. The newer one, 27 years later, from 2006, uh, excuse me, 2016, are available if you're interested in getting any further reading done on, on the topic. So thank you.